right, everyone. Uh, welcome to Senate Utilities Committee. We're going to get started today. And uh, we've got a hearing today on um, House Bill 2329, which updates the entities who are subject to the Pipeline Safety Program of the State Corporation Commission. And to get started, I'm going to uh, go to the uh, to Bill Brief from Nick Myers from our Revisor's Office. Nick, I'll turn it over to you to uh, update us on House Bill 2329. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon, Committee. Um, committee, House Bill 2329 would amend current law relating to pipeline safety rules and regulations that are overseen and enforced by the Kansas Corporation Commission. So the Kansas Corporation Commission works in conjunction with uh, uh, the, the federal government to oversee uh, pipeline safety regulations and uh, pipeline safety inspections in the state. And this statute uh, authorizes the KCC to adopt rules and regulations that conform with those federal natural gas pipeline safety uh, laws and rules and regulations. So currently, under the state law, the following entities are subject to the pipeline safety rules and regulations. So you can see that all public utilities and municipalities uh, that uh, transport or provide uh, natural gas distribution to end users are covered. Um, all operators of master meter systems as defined in the federal regulations. So these are uh, typically your mobile home parks, your housing projects, or apartment complexes where gas is distributed. Uh, to a main uh, uh, owner, uh, main meter, and then uh, further distributed out to the to the residents of, of one of those uh, locations. Um, also in current law, all operators of privately or publicly owned pipelines providing natural gas service or transportation directly to the consumer for the purpose of manufacturing goods or generating power and then finally, providers of rural gas service that are operating under the provisions of the Kansas Health Help Gas Act um, in, in state statute. So what the bill would do is it would add a fifth uh, uh, entity uh, that would be subject to uh, the pipeline safety rules and regulations. And the bill would provide that all operators of gathering lines as defined in uh, federal regulation would also be subject to the pipeline safety rules and regulations. And then I will note that the bill additionally would remove the current statutory provision that excludes pipelines that provide natural gas service directly to the ultimate consumer if that use is for farming or oil and gas production. And Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to answer any questions the committee has. Thank you, Nick. Committee, do you have any questions for Nick? Seeing none, thank you very much. I might note that also in the uh, bill uh, originally, from what I understand, there were some uh, concerns over the uh, penalties that were there, and so that was stricken from the bill. And so it's a pretty pretty straightforward, I believe. Uh, let's hear from our proponents now. We just have one. That's Leo Hanos, who's the chief engineer from uh, Utilities Division of uh, Kansas Corporation Commission. Leo, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, members of the committee. Uh, KCC staff supports. 2329, as Nick mentioned, it is a, a, a bill that looks at trying to set the division of authority between the KCC and the federal government. The, regula the regulator on the federal side is known by their acronym PHMSA, which stands for Pipeline Hazardous Materials Safety Administration, and we pronounce that as FEMSA. Uh, the federal law, which is uh, the Natural Gas Pipeline Safety Act, gives FEMSA authority over all pipelines that transport gas uh, flammable gas. So they have authority of all the pipelines, but the law, the federal law also says states, you can have primacy over intrastate pipelines if you set up a pipeline safety program and uh, you uh, take over jurisdiction of those set regulations for them, which we've done. Kansas has done that since 1970. We've had an intrastate pipeline safety program. Uh, so one thing to note is this bill does not expand authority over a pipeline that's never been regulated before. These pipelines that we're talking about are right now regulated underneath the federal program, but because they're intrastate programs, we'll move those to the state. <clears throat> so the two categories of pipeline that we're talking about, and Nick had mentioned one was gas gathering lines. A gathering line is basically a pipeline that moves gas from production to the transmission lines. Uh, <clears throat> this type of pipeline for years, we thought was underneath our, our jurisdiction, in fact. And as it turns out, 
the feds, the federal side asked us to take a hard look at our, our enabling statutes. And at that time, our, our litigation attorneys had decided that, no, in fact, we didn't have that jurisdiction and we need to go back and amend the, the statute to get it. Um, but those lines for a long time were not even regulated by FEMSA. FEMSA had authority to regulate them, but they chose not to because they felt the safety risk was not that large for gathering lines. Uh, as it turns out, in 2006, Congress told them that they would have to regulate those. Uh, they began to regulate non-rural uh, pipelines and that, that would be gathering lines inside of city limits or those where you have a house or a school next to the pipeline. And that's been in, the, in federal regulations since 2006. After an explosion in West Texas here a couple of years ago, the Congress came back and asked uh, Congress again, asked FEMSA again to regulate the lower pressure gathering lines. And beginning in uh, actually in May of this year, there will be regulations on the lower pressure lines that are larger than eight inches in diameter. <clears throat> um, Regarding the direct sales lines, these are the lines that take gas from an interstate pipeline, so a transmission line, and they move the gas to the customer, um, to a consumer customer. A good one to example would be a power plant. Um, and that, that's going to be gas is in transportation. So the company that has the power plant, there's one over near Gardner that um, Evergy operates, where they move the gas about 15 miles along the um, right away with their transmission line coming from the power plant. They bring gas from Southern Star into the, into the um, generating station. That pipeline is in transport, the gas is in transportation, going to a large, cust large customer, therefore it's subject to our regulations. However, when we got authority to have uh, jurisdiction over direct sales lines, uh, the legislature in 1993 had um, exempted any kind of pipelines that take gas from, um, a, a transmission pipeline to an activity that deals with oil and gas recovery or for farming. At this time, we don't believe we have any pipelines like that in the state that um, serve that purpose where the gas is in transportation. There are privately owned pipelines, but the gas has already gone beyond transportation where it's already been purchased by the owner <clears throat> at that point. Um, <clears throat> So again, what this bill does is it tries to uh, uh, set this, the stage to make sure that any intrastate gas pipelines are underneath Kansas authority. And as uh, I think the chairman mentioned, originally this bill had language in there that was that would have changed the civil caps for penalties. Again, this was at FEMSA's request that we, or actually Congress's request that we match the federal uh, caps on penalties. Uh, the House last year elected to strike that provision. And, you know, while removing that does cost the state some funding for the pipeline safety program, we lose about $5,000 a year. But <clears throat> we still feel the caps we have, which are $25,000 a day per violation per day, up to a million dollars for any group of violations. We feel those caps are still effective for us, and it's been working well with us over the years. So. At this time, we'll support the, the House Amendment. Uh, now, on the other hand, if we don't have jurisdiction over all interstate piping, as this bill is asking for, we will lose about $10,000 a year in federal funding. And while that, yeah, you know, it's a significant amount of funding for us, it's not that big of an issue. I think uh, the, the main thing to think about here is this bill really puts all Kansas pipelines underneath Kansas authority rather than having um, FEMSA be involved at, look at watching over our intrastate operators. I think that pretty much sums up my testimony. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Leo. Uh, committee, any questions? Senator Hawk? Uh, thank you. Could you give me an example of what a violation would be? Uh, who might be violating it? And uh, how you might assess that $25,000 a day, how long does it take uh, a provider to fix whatever that violation might be? I'm not clear about what kinds of things might be violations and how this might apply. Sure. There, There is quite a bit of regulations there that we, we've looked at. Now, I will say that it has been the practice of the commission to work to get companies in compliance rather than to assess penalties. Um, 
our, our goal has always been just to try to get compliance, but it's a tool that we use when we have to, when we have a, a violation. Uh, let me think of the last one we've done, possibly would have been an um, uh, incident regarding um, failure to follow a procedure which was required to have uh, for blowing down a pipeline. Um, they ended up basically having a small cut in the pipeline and starting a fire there to burn off the gas. Well, before the end of the day, uh, the, the plug that was holding the gas back broke loose. It's like a big stopper. And we had full flow of gas on here and a large fire. No one was hurt, destroyed some equipment and destroyed some trees. It actually was on the campus of uh, University of Kansas. Um, and we, we penalized um, the operator for that, for failure to follow the procedures that they should have had in place. Uh, so in cases where we have, um, uh, you know, an infraction that results in some property damage or even a loss of life at times, we take a hard look at what the requirements are and see what was followed. If it's a r routine thing like um, oh, a low reading on a, on a, a leak survey or something that wasn't done correctly or the timing was missed how frequent they have to do it, we would send them a, a notice of violation and have them just correct that and get back on schedule with us. That's more, that's about 99% of what we do as a matter of fact. Thanks for clarifying that. I, I, I noticed what was crossed out was some penalties of $200,000 and, and uh, not to exceed $2 million. Is that what other states do? That's the federal uh, Congress set those penalties. Every four years, Congress has to reauthorize the Pipeline Safety Act on the federal side. And every four years, whatever's in the news at that time gets reflected into uh, the Pipeline Safety Act. And it, this last one was um, they've actually tied the penalty, maximum penalties to like, uh, like a price index. So the penalty now is $220,000 per day per violation up to 2.2 million. And next year, or actually this year, is gonna change again. And as inflation goes up, that penalty will rise with that. And that was done because of some um, large pipelines that had some significant accidents. And this was Congress's way of saying, this is the message we wanna send. And one last question. How many violations would you say we have on average per year? We have, a effective, we have an active inspection program. We're looking at every operator every year. Um, we probably have 140, 150 um, violations, I would say, on a given year. But, but most of those you work with the producer and don't assess that $25,000 penalty? Under pipeline safety, the, I'd say the largest number of penalties we're assessing lately have been for third-party damage uh, from... Um, uh, pipelines not getting uh, locates done for, for uh, one call purposes and the pipe getting hit because of that. Uh, but that's not per violation. That's over a series of violations. So I, I think we've seen some of those for one company being about $60,000 a year maybe. Over, but that was you know over 60 or 70 violations. I appreciate that. Very informative. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Would this have any effect on those gathering lines where, like, the farmers have their taps off that go to their irrigation pumps? Where the farmers have taps going off of irrigation, it's been our interpretation that the gas at those points is is not in transportation any longer, so it's not jurisdictional to us or to the federal side. And that's been the position of uh, both, I mean, I've talked to my colleagues in Nebraska, Colorado, Kansas, and, uh, and Texas, and Oklahoma about that, and that's been our, our position. We don't believe they're jurisdictional. Thank you. Any other questions? Senator Olson. Um, so this will probably hit, uh, you know, I, I know of a few of these small towns that have these small gathering systems. So would, I mean, they have 500 customers or... 400, this will probably hit them pretty good then, huh? Um, the town's gathering, remember, run, runs gas from production to transmission. So once it's in transmission and going back to to the towns for delivery, that's distribution. They've always been jurisdictional to us and remain so. I think we have about 53 small towns 
And, you know, it, it's a blend with operators when you're doing these type of inspections. You range almost from a consultant for the small towns to some of the more like an inspector enforcer for some of the larger companies, you know, you, you're all across that spectrum. So small towns won't be affected by this at all. They've already been underneath Kansas jurisdiction since the 70s. It's from the wellhead to the, the, you know. There's a little bit of a distinction there. From the wellhead until you have uh, essentially two lines joining, uh -huh. that's production piping. At this time, PHMSA uh, does not see that as being in transportation yet. When it becomes gathering, because that's, that's defined in the federal law, at that juncture, uh, then it becomes jurisdictional. Okay. Thank you. Senator Francisco. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you for this. So um, looking back at the um, note that has been stricken now but was about civil penalties, in both cases that was a maximum. That's correct. Do you also have rules and regs? that set any of those penalties, or is it only in statute? It's only in statute as a maximum. We set penalties base, based on a matrix that we've developed. where we're, we, we try to look at the factors that, that led to the penalty being uh, assessed, and then we recommend them to the commission, who then has to vote on, on the, the penalty that we recommend. So if we were to add this language back, you probably wouldn't change your matrix. No, we would not. We, we've, we have never issued the maximum penalty in Kansas. Any other questions? So I'm guessing basically what, even without that Section 2 in there, you're still relying on the federal penalties, correct? No, the federal. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm misunderstanding that. Where the, where the state of Kansas has primacy over intrastate pipelines that we've put into our statutes, uh, it, the federal government does not have authority over them except for the fact that if, if, we, you know, if they take away our certification, uh, then they could enforce the penalty on it. And then actually if you read the, the code, which is found in USC 6101, 60101, then it goes on for... I don't know, 20 or 30 different uh, paragraphs. Uh, it'll tell you about what is required for certification. And it does say you have to have substantially similar penalties. So I, I think the Fed, feds probably could come in and dispute that with you, but I've never heard of them doing that. And I did notice on the fiscal note, I, I'm not sure if the fiscal note is... Correct. <laughs> Although we'll see, it says according to the Kansas Corporation Commission, was result in an increased revenue to the agency of approximately fifteen thousand per year. But it sounded to me like uh, it would actually cost the commission. Well, I think what they're getting at there is that we, right now, because you know what the the Natural Gas Pipeline Safety Act does is it allows the states to have primacy, and it requires the federal government to fund those programs the state programs. So they pay up to 80%. But every year they come in and they inspect our program. They see how well we're doing as far as um, the program as a whole and how we have met their different requirements, one of which is that we have jurisdiction over all interstate pipelines. And they, they discount it or they take back some of the money they would have given us. So we've, we've been averaging about $10,000 a year because we didn't have jurisdiction over these two. And we lost about, we still will lose $5,000 a year uh, for not having jurisdiction over that maximum penalty cap. Any other questions? Senator Francisco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So is there any concern that, um, as you call it, FEMSA would take over um, jurisdiction or um, authority? No, there's none. <laughs> Apparently they don't want it. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. We were worried about that in terms of uh, what coal combustion residue sites. So, in the pipeline world, I, I, I can assure you that it is not FIMS's remotest dream to take over a pipeline safety program. <laughs> okay. Any more? Seeing none. Thank you, Leo. We appreciate yeah. it very much, committee. I think what we'll do is plan on uh, letting you contemplate this and. Uh, We'll plan on working the bill tomorrow. 
Um, also tomorrow, uh, given the situation in uh, Ukraine um, and some information that was brought to me, I thought we'd have a, a, a brief on the state of the energy once again uh, from Kyoga coming in tomorrow to give us kind of an update so you can ask questions about supply, energy costs, things of that nature, and, and we'll plan on that tomorrow as, long, uh, as well as working this bill. Um, and then uh, Friday we will have no meeting. Uh, so I believe that is it for today. Thanks for your work, committee, and we are adjourned.